Thank you for joining for this episode of the Techspective Podcast. Uh, my friend uh, Richard Steenan joins us. Uh, Richard, if you would like to give a little bit of uh, intro and background on yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tony. It's great to be here, of course. Um, I'm a industry analyst. Um, got into that uh, realm in 2000, so it's been 24 years since I joined Gartner. And since then, I've started my own firm. And I'm just so focused on creating what I call a data-driven analyst firm. Um, and it, my timing for once in my entire career is good because right when uh, we were trying to do all this, um, open AI, generative AI, and large language models came into play, and I'm leveraging them heavily to actually build uh, a service and platform and a database of all the data I can get my hands on about cybersecurity companies. Okay. Yeah, and you know, it, it is, you know, when you first did, you know, and we'll get to talking about this year's or whatever, but when you did you know, Security Year Book 2020, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually a little bit curious, like, when you, when you, when you kicked off the, you know, and, and I mean, just so, just so there's some frame of reference, I mean, it's 2020. Nice. Um, but when you when you started it and you started the project and 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 you know and you've written other books and you've written other books in the meantime um but did you envision it being its own like taking on a life of its own like security your book and and the and the on and the the accompanying database are like a whole separate industry for you yep yeah yeah oh completely it was a pivot um you know i the the business model behind writing books, you know, for an independent consultant, whatever, is public speaking gigs, right? You get paid for those, book signings and all the rest, right? You don't make money on the books. Um, and in 2019, I had actually written a book um, along with uh, Jay Chaudhry at Zscaler called Secure Cloud Transforma Transformation. And I was um, basically sitting in their booth, signing books, hundreds of people coming by, at, at RSA 2019. And quite a few of the people said, hey, I'm brand new to the cybersecurity industry, and my employer um, sent me to RSA to learn about the cybersecurity industry. And, you know, veterans would laugh at the concept of being able to get anything out of that conference uh, other than the current snapshot in time of what's hot. You know, you 2019 would have come away thinking XDR was security and everything else don't pay attention to. And at the same time, I'd walk the show floor and I'd meet these startups in the booths along the, the periphery, and they'd have some new concept that they're so excited about, but every single one of them, I could say, oh, so you're like so-and-so from 20 years ago, and they would go, who's that? Never heard of it. In other words, we're losing our history, um, and only, I hate to think of myself as an old geezer in the space, but um, people are dying right and left, it seems. The so how to capture that well write a history book so i had the simultaneous idea of writing the history of the cybersecurity industry and this was a place to finally publish all the data i've been keeping for years and years you know just a, a big google sheet of all the cybersecurity vendors so that was the birth of it and because it was uh, the culmination of all that research i've been doing for so many years uh, it did feel like a um you know i planned on it being transformational. I calculate that, you know, there are um, four or five million people who are employed in the industry, you know, actually at vendors, um, but there must be tens of millions of people who actually do security. It should be really easy to sell 50,000 books into that space, right? When it's only history and the only place you can go where you can actually see the names of all the vendors. Um, of course, you know, it just turns out people don't buy books. Um, you know, they don't, they don't, unlike you, look at, the books behind you there um the it, it's really really hard to sell books so um that's okay though you know i've I, I got speaking gigs unfortunately i launched security your book 2020 at rsa 2020 two weeks before COVID hit and right. all speaking all speaking gigs seem to shut down forever for me um so we're just not there anymore but still the book is i mean it's it's my life's work it's everything I know about the industry put in one place. Um, it's very uh, 
uh, it's great for me because I rewrite it every year. I have to read my own book every year to, to update it. Um, so I, you know, I relearn the history <laughs> every time I do that. I think I'm the only person who's read them all. Um, and it's just a great process. And then, of course, this year, instead of paying for design and and book covers and printing. Um, I'm, I'm turning the entire process over to Wiley. So now I've got, you know, all of their editorial staff helping. Uh, it's going to be a great, great book. And it'll be out earlier than I could get because Wiley has some pull with the printers. I was actually, that was one of the things I was going to bring up and ask you about is, you know, you you and I, you know, I mean, I've, I've written, you know, you talk about my books. Actually, my, my wall of books like yours is actually over here to my left. Okay. These books are just the ones that I either wrote or contributed to, and they're just strategically placed because they're on the video. Um, yep. Yep. Exactly. But, um, but you and I have had conversations over the years about that process and about, you know, like, I mean, I still get, um, for, for, for my book, you know, like my main book, the one that I like literally, you know, brainstormed and thought up on my own and 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 wrote beginning to end because a lot of these i just contributed to sure yep um i still get quarterly checks or whatever yeah. yep. but it's like you know nine dollars and 43 cents you know yep. fifteen dollars yep. and 18 cents you know so it's like and, and and this book was you know this came out in like 2006 or seven you know, so it's you know, it's 17 years later. I don't expect anyone to be buying that book. Nobody should be buying that book now. It's there's nothing in there that's relevant. <laughs> but I still get these checks trickling in. Uh, and you and I've talked about how that that model is kind of messed up. I mean, you know, like when I when I go out, I mean, I could probably, I mean, I have ideas right now. I could go pitch publishers. I could probably find one that would be willing to take one of my ideas. They give me some kind of a you know upfront you know payment or whatever. It might be. Three thousand, that might be five thousand, whatever. Right. But the but the reality is, the chances that I'll ever make more than that and actually start getting royalties on top of it are slim to none. Right. Statistically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you you have your 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 Dan Browns and your John Grishams and your you know whatever uh, you or, know people out there in our in our space, Malcolm Gladwell, Michael Lewis. Yeah. yeah right. They do very well. But. But you, at one point many years ago, made the you know had, you know went through this whole process in your own head, and decided to start self-publishing. And when you did the first three, the, you know, the, the, yeah, the first you know the first three of these uh, of the security year book, you self-published these um, yep. because you know and, and and you know like I said, you and I've talked about that because I, I would look at it and I'd say, okay, well, you know, did my book sell a million copies? No, but it did sell whatever. Let's say it sold twenty thousand. You know, okay, yep. well, why why did I only see you know, three thousand dollars out of this deal when they sold twenty thousand books at fifty bucks a pop. Right. You know, so it's like if I cut out the middleman or four or five of the middlemen and just write a book and sell it directly, I could instead of selling a book for fifty five dollars, I could sell a book for fifteen dollars, but I'm pocketing twelve dollars a book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It, that's all the thought process that went through my head. The uh, publishers, as you know, today expect the author to do all the marketing. Um, you know, they they just don't have resources or people who understand marketing. So the publisher has to do it all. Um, and but it is very expensive to print your own book. And the one huge, huge advantage that I've learned in going all the way with security your book and actually, you know, printing them, binding them, storing them in a warehouse and then tying the sales to, you know, WooCommerce on my website is that I have all the data on everybody who's ever purchased a book. Whereas if you sell through Amazon, the, the traditional way of doing uh, self-publishing, you don't see that. You barely get to figure out what you're doing that causes sales. Whereas now if I post about the book and I get three sales that day, I know exactly you know, who read my post and, and got it. So data and it just gives you insight into Amazon's business model. They know who what yeah. everybody in the world buys all the time. Well, you know, I mean, I have uh, you, you and I talked about before I kicked off the podcast that I have um, the collection, except for the some for some reason I'm missing 2021. I don't know why. So I have 2022 20, and 23. Um, so I mean, I get it every year, and 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 then I've I appreciate 
the format of basically saying, hey, we're going to do some chapters up front of like, you know, here's some interesting stuff. Here's some, you know, maybe a little, a little bit of cybersecurity history, a little bit of profiling of, of, you know, a company or technology. And then, you know, but then you get into the back half and you get into the, the data of it, you know, and, and it's, it, it's a lot of data. Um, uh, you know, I, I personally have used this, you know, so in, in my role as a, you know, freelance, you know, marketing consultant and content creator working for vendors, and there are a number of vendors that I've had relationships with forever, but, uh, you know, budgets dry up. And so I'll, I'll like open the book and be like, all right, well, there's 2,900 vendors in here I've never talked to, you know, yep. so I can just start reaching out to companies and be like, hello. Yeah. And now um, every day somebody reaches out and says, hey, uh, you know, I was part of a riff and I'm looking for a job and, you know, do you have any ideas? I said, well, you know, where do you want to work and what kind of companies do you like, you know, uh, a round or mature companies. Once they give me those, I just run those filters through our platform and I send them a, a spreadsheet of all the companies they should reach out to and based on the ones that got recent funding and the ones right. that are growing. Right. Because that's it. I, yeah. I feel like there's a there's a. You know, a, a, a side hustle business opportunity there where if you there connect, isn't. <laughs> It, well, if, you, if you connect your if you connect your database with like Indeed or or you know or Monster or whatever, and and give people the ability to to kind of filter that way and be like, all right, I, yeah. you know, I'm looking for a job. I don't, you know, like I, yeah. I've already worked for five startups. I want to work for a more mature company. Yep, we've already ingested all the LinkedIn job postings for all three thousand seven hundred fifty vendors. Um, and yeah, I can't find a business model because when you're out of work, you don't spend money on finding a job, right? Because you're trying to cut your budgets yourself. So it's you're not certainly not going to spend the fourteen thousand dollars that we charge for access to our platform. So better yet, I uh, just give away the advice and suggestions, and then um, you know when somebody gets hired, maybe they'll their company will be a customer in the future. Well, and you know, aside from what I do. With TechSpective and Forbes and and doing my you know fr freelancing stuff, I mean I've you know for the past roughly decade I've also had a full time day job most of the time, and you know I've also been on the market now for going on eight months, um, and you know last time I was on the market, you know I, I I had multiple interviews and I had three written offers in within thirty days, you know so with it within a month I got to choose who I wanted to work for. Um, this time it's like, you know, and I've had this conversation before on the podcast, but it's like there are so many job openings out there at, at face value. Like if I go on LinkedIn, if I go on Indeed, it's like there's just there's there's plenty to apply to, yeah. um, but so many of them, like there isn't even an auto generated response. Like you send this application into the void and you never hear anything. Um, yeah, because uh, yeah, hiring has been frozen for the last eighteen months, um, but my advice is hang in there all hell is going to break loose the despite you know today february 21st uh crazy things going on in the stock market um i'm convinced that we are entering into an era uh, that will make the dot-com boom seem like a blip the the world of technology is going to impact the entire economy we're going to be in boom times like none of us have ever experienced, um, similar to, I don't know, the, the California gold rush, maybe. Um, it's just good times ahead, mind you, but the vendors who have been uh, cutting back because their investors were so gun shy, right? The investors just got so scared, one by the stock market drop, but two by Silicon Valley Bank's failure. Um, they just pulled in they're just quit you know whimpering right. <laughs> waiting for the sun to come out uh, and they're going to miss it so the they're going you know the vendors that listen to their investors are going to go wait a minute we just we just hit our targets and exceeded our plan and now we don't have the people to you know backfill and do all the work that we right. we've sold well and I'm, they're going to be go competing with all, they're going to be competing with everybody else to get those people now instead of you know Hire now, hire today. Right. You know, don't let well, people go. 
All right. Well, I was going to say on, on on the one hand, I was going to, I was going to point out that I've I've made that I've made the point a number of times when it comes to marketing. I feel like when when companies marketing is like often one of the first things to go. They they look and they say, okay, well, your budgets are tightening. All right. Well, we still want to we we still want to do product. You know, we we still need to do you know we still need to maintain operations. Um, but let's you know we'll we'll cut back on marketing. And I've made the argument where I'm like, look. The market, you know, the economy's down, market's down, whatever. Everyone's kind of like, you know, laying low. But it is going to turn around. I mean, I, you know, you can look at the, you know, the history. It's like, yes, it goes down. It always comes back up. It is going to turn around. And when it does turn around, you don't want to be starting from ground zero. Like, like, like nobody knows what your brand even is or whatever. It's like, so there's a, there's a logic in my mind. And again, I'm, I'm biased because it's the industry I work in. But in my mind... Right. You need to keep marketing because you want your brand to be top of mind when things turn around and companies start looking for you know ways to spend money again. You want them to go, oh, I, you know, now that I've got money, I want to go do that. Right. Yep. Yeah. They'll pick up the phone when the salesperson calls because they recognize the company name, and they recognize what you do, and they're like, yeah, we're ready. You're. I totally agree with you. Um, I guess I don't know if I'd ever be a good you know, venture back CEO. <laughs> well, but. I'm curious, you know, so if, if your, if your outlook, if your you know, prediction and your optimism or whatever are in any way connected to or related to, uh, you know, the current generative AI revolution. Um, and, 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 and I'll, and I'll frame that somewhat by, you know, I, I again, I've had this conversation in previous podcasts, but, you know, I've likened this to, the you know the advent of google like you know like you know we had search engines all of a sudden google came along and it kind of just transformed everything um yep. you know and, and like you, you mentioned like the dot-com boom or whatever like i feel like yep. it's a it's an early kind of wild west i mean there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot of hurdles and 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 and, and hiccups that we need to address in terms of generative ai kind of refining how we do it and, and, and stuff like that but there's so much potential on that and, and Every conversation I've had in the last year somehow comes around to generative AI. Like everyone is looking for, like, how do I weave this in? How do I make use of this? How do I take advantage of this for our customers? And so, like, it seems like that's that that's just that is the next big thing. Yep, it is definitely the next big thing. It is in my mind, you know. So when when I first discovered the internet three years before Bill Gates, by the way. Um, I had everybody back then had the same experience. They just go, oh my God, this is amazing. I can see all this stuff. I can send emails. I can talk to people. Uh, it expands, is, expands the opportunities ahead of me. Uh, I dropped everything. I dropped my career as an automotive engineer, started an ISP and never looked back, right? Got into security shortly after that. But I watched, you know, I, I was, I saw the numbers recently. So I got on the internet when there were fewer than a million people on the internet, which is early, you know, but it seemed at the time like everybody I knew was getting on the internet. Um, and now, you know, we're at 3 billion people on the internet. The um, large language models as, you know, revealed to us by uh, chat GPT in November, the end of November of, of 2022. So it's been 14 months. Um, had the same impact on everybody. It's like everybody sees it, goes, oh, my God. Um, it was the fastest growing um, uh, consumer adoption of anything in history. Within six weeks, they had 100 million users of ChatGPT. Um, nothing like, you know, I remember when Lion King came out in video cassette back when we had those, right? Huh? Um, they were so prepared for it that they had 5 million copies ready. And that was at the time, the biggest consumer event in history. This is 20 times bigger and, and you know, 12 times more expensive. Uh, and yet people are paying for it. OpenAI is making $200 million a month for on $20 million subscriptions. It's crazy. NVIDIA is growing 238% year over year, just selling the chips just to the open AIs and Googles and Microsofts who are training large language models. Uh, this is gonna have the biggest impact on uh, our markets, our economies and our lives of anything in our lives. You think I'm upbeat enough? <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, I, and, I don't, and I don't disagree. I mean, you know, like I said, I think there are, there are some hiccups and hurdles and like, you know, one of the conversations I've had is uh, 
the idea of having, you know, like the, to the extent that there's, you know, this tremendous potential for a large language model um, that it makes sense to have more focused large, you know, like for for instance, you know, like so ChatGPT, you know, I, I look at it and say, okay, well, its data set is the internet, you know, and it, and and it's trying to know everything or whatever, um, but you could create one, you know, create a, a, a more specific generative AI where you say, okay, well, my data set is just going to be everything there is to know about cardiothoracic surgery or whatever. And then it becomes much more refined where like when you ask it a question, you, you, you have, I think, a higher degree of confidence in the responses because it's not looking at the entire internet. It doesn't care what, you know, Joe in Nebraska said about cardiothoracic surgery. It's like, it's very specific information that it's pulling from. Um, yeah, you know, it's a difference. It's a difference between intelligence and knowledge, right? And admittedly, uh, uh, GPT has more knowledge than any human will ever have, um, and it's uh, that's available to it. Um, but the question is whether or not it's taken all of that knowledge and somehow gained intelligence by being able to interpret it. And of course, some, for us, it feels like it's intelligent when you talk to it because it's crazy how good it is um and i think that's the important thing is if you had something that was uh you know at least as intelligent as a human and then gave it the you know the medical information you wanted it could interpret that medical information better than a human because it has perfect recall and exposure to all the knowledge so i think that's the excitement is they're they're working on that Right now, a lot of people are working on that, um, and they're the. Let's see, they you know, there's been a project. I think Google um, has been working on folding proteins, and that you know, just looking at every single possible combination of everything in biochemistry to fold proteins, and it's starting to get results. Um, and some people have turned OpenAI on to. Uh, um, material science so they're looking at every combination of materials and which ones will form a crystal lattice that does what and they're discovering new stuff by doing that so you know all those things will have you know, uh, just cascading impacts on our lives right well i think for for me the sort of moment of realization for oh this is this isn't just like a you know neat fad this is like this is a next generation thing was when I started hearing that Google was having a little bit of an oh shit moment about OpenAI, and, it, and I immediately thought of Microsoft and Netscape. How you know Bill Gates was like, "Ah, eh, that's not a thing. We're you know we're we're Microsoft," and all of a sudden Netscape took off, and he's like, "Oh shit, the internet's actually a thing. Yeah. We need a browser. We need a browser now." And that's kind of where Google was. Google was like, "Oh, okay, we need generative AI now." Right. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. So my. Uh... And most recent, you know, with when you're working with this stuff, it's every day you go, oh my god. Um, so of course, uh, OpenAI created their GPT store, which is just you know, that you can just create your own GPTs and make them available to everybody else. I created one called Socrates Pro, um, which has all my books in it, so you can get it to you know use my thinking on the cybersecurity industry to write white papers and stuff like that. Fantastic. Somebody posted to Reddit. They had a GPT, and it was uh, it created personas. So they had a CFO or whatever type of buyer persona um, for enterprise. So I went to it and I quickly got it to create a CISO persona. And we're in the process with our database of switching uh, who our target market is. Right, right now it's uh, all the venture capitalists out there, which there are eight thousand, um, and. But our target market as we switch to covering products is going to be CISOs. So, okay, so the classic, you know how this works, you call up a bunch of CISOs and say, hey, I've got all this data. How would you like to see it and how could you possibly use it? Well, you know, CISOs are very practical people. They don't imaginatively think about what could be in the future. So they, it's like pulling teeth getting them to give you actionable insights that you can then turn productize, right? So I asked this GPT persona, what features would you like to see in a database tool for 
um, all 16,000 cybersecurity products. It just typed up 10 features in order that we're doing them already. So the first two it, it had, right? We, we've got the products themselves and exhaustive ability to uh, rank them based on the vendor or what they do. And then comparative tools, and stuff like that. Just that's going, we are going to build a product based on a product plan uh, and roadmap generated by AI representing CISOs. So it's, yeah, it's mind blowing. That saves us six months. Well, and, and you yeah, know, so yeah, obviously the, you know, the conversation comes around all the time. You know, I mean, it's, it seems like every, every other headline related to this is about how, you know, the robots and the, and the AI are, are going to take everyone's jobs and, 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 you know, uh, in a, in, to to an extent, some of that will happen. You know, I, I had a you know the podcast recently with uh, Sam Curry from uh, Zscaler, um, and you know, and he, and he drew the analogy of, uh, you know, the 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 advent of the automobile and the and the and the impact on the horse industry. It's like yes, jobs went away. You know, like the, the or or at least were or at least became niche. Artisan yeah. jobs that you only find, right. you know, it's like five people in the country know how to do. Um, yep. So, but but it also creates an entire new segment of jobs out of out of thin air at the same time. Um, so there is some, there are some pains to go through there. But for the most part, I feel like it's not that the jobs are going to go away. It's just the jobs change. The jobs elevate. Like you know, when I look at the way cybersecurity in general is applying generative AI. A lot of it is level one sock stuff. It's level. It's it's. Yeah, yeah. Can I totally. feed all of this data through the generative AI? Let it do the thing that I would normally pay someone, you know, an entry level person to like do the grunt work of weeding through this stuff and and finding like, okay, what are the ten or twenty things we should actually focus on? But generative AI can do that in the blink of an eye. Yep. And so now you now your entry level workers in in a sock can do something else. Right. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully something that leverages AI to get ahead. I always think of the poor um, uh, SEO content writers, right, who wrote those horrible articles that just destroyed the value of the internet in Google. Um, because all you can find is a stupid article that's just rehashed stuff and poorly written. Um, you can really do that fast with ChatGPT. So, um, so all those guys would be out of a business other than the fact that they're already adapting, right? They, you know, they were kind of on cutting edge. If you're doing SEO stuff, you're a computer person and you're constantly worried about how Google changes their algorithm. So you're ready to change how you do things. Now you're just spitting that stuff out with chat GPT. I don't know if, an, you know, an SEO content creator is, probably hasn't typed a, one word after another <laughs> since this all happened. Yeah, but you know, at least at least when it comes to content and media, I feel like there's a there's a self perpetuating downward spiral there. And I talked about it a little bit. Like, so you know, TM, TMZ called me up one you know one time last fall and had I did I did a little interview with TMZ with, about generative AI because they were doing a thing about someone made a song deep faking someone and. We were talking about like, is this the you know the the downfall of humanity kind of stuff? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, on the one hand, you know, ChatGPT isn't a silver bullet. It's not magic. It doesn't know anything that you know isn't already known. It's just it's just googling very fast and producing results. Um, but I also said that it becomes a it, it becomes a self feeding spiral when. ChatGPT is using the internet to get its answers, but then someone asks ChatGPT to create content, and they put that content online. Well, now ChatGPT's mediocre content is its data set. Yep, yep. No, oh, you're you're totally right. I think the because uh, is all content since November of 2021 is or 2022 is going to be impacted by the large language models. So it's diminishing returns now. Um, now, mind you, maybe scientific papers and yeah, the contents of the news outlets, et cetera, is all valuable and such, but it's being assisted by OpenAI in most, 
for sure journal articles are. Um, yeah, it's a it's yeah, I think it's just diminishing returns, but luckily there's so much to be squeezed out of all human knowledge up to um, a year ago. Yeah, and well, and there's also there's a, a there's a cultural or like a generational aspect to it as well um, in that, you know, I make my living you know, and in large part writing blog posts and like yeah. my wife and I were talking the other day and she was like, yeah, but does anyone read blog posts anymore? Like that's the, you know, like, like, yeah. And, and, and a lot of the stuff when you go, if you go to like, you know, if you go Google something or you just go to Google news and you say, okay, Hey, what, what are the, what are the kind of emerging trending headlines? Like 90% of the links you click on take you to some sort of like bullshit slideshow content that, you know, you have to click through 75 slides and, and they, and they actually never get to the point of the, of the sensational headline that they started with. Yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're clicking yeah. through going, okay, but where's, where's the actual news? And it turns out there yeah. isn't any. Um, right. And, and, and so like recipes, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so like, I, I feel like the, The, the the sort of like i'm gonna i'm gonna fire the actual writers and i'm gonna like you know rely on you know ai to create content becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of yeah see nobody wants to read content anymore and it's like well no no one wants to read your crap content <laughs> right right yeah like right, if you were yeah. writing good content people would read it yep yep yeah that's i you know, I'm a reader, and I still would rather read than watch your YouTube video. Um, uh, and you're you're still dating yourself. It fast. needs to be on TikTok. No one wants to see your YouTube video either. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's like we all we all need to figure out how to how to take what we were going to put into a blog post and turn it into like a you know thirty to thirty to sixty second uh, TikTok video. Yeah, yeah, just like Twitter kind of destroyed long form blogging because. I found this for me, right? 80% of my blog's traffic used to come from Twitter. And, but over time, you know, you have an idea that you could expound in 800 words, or you could condense it to 256 characters and just get it out of your head and put it on Twitter. Well, the other interesting thing, interesting thing for me is, you know, so I'll, I'll write a blog post and then I'll go post it and promote it on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. Yep. And I mean, I've got a, a good amount of followers on, on LinkedIn. And so, you know, depending on the, you know, I don't know, LinkedIn's, you know, the, the dark arts of the algorithm in the background. So I know that like not all 5,000 plus people are actually going to see my post necessarily, right. but yep. it's exposed to some segment of the LinkedIn population yep. and it gets a number of likes, it gets a number of shares, other people post it. And I can, so I can see all the analytics in LinkedIn. And what baffles me is that a lot of times I have, better engagement or views of the LinkedIn post than the actual blog content. People are saying, people are liking my LinkedIn post and then sharing it with others and saying, yeah, this is, you know, you should, you should read this, but they themselves didn't read it apparently because yep. Yep. I don't, I don't have that. I don't have matching traffic on the blog post. And so it's like, people are just liking and sharing the post about the post. Yeah. 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 Or if you, you know, include a statement about the post in your, LinkedIn posts, then that's what they're reacting to. Yeah, I've been tracking and pretty much if I get um, 20,000 views of a LinkedIn post, you know, about my blog, then I'll get less than a thousand views of the actual blog. So a 20th comes through. And if, if there's a call to action um, out of a thousand people who actually visit the blog and maybe read it, um, six will click on the link to whatever I'm directing them towards. Yeah, I want to. Some, sometimes I'll sell a book. <laughs> I was gonna say I want to like do do a like do do an Easter egg or something where I like at the at the very bottom of the blog post put in like a hey cl click here and you know you'll 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 be you know you'll win this prize or you know whatever. Right. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. it's the 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 prize for actually reading the content. Um, but but going back to your thing about as an author writing books, that it's really it's not no so much about the money you make from the books it's about your brand and being able to get speaking gigs um you could look at the content the same way like you're getting the visibility on linkedin like your 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 brand is getting 
the exposure that that you want, whether or not people actually go read the blog content kind of becomes secondary. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And then, you know, as you build that brand, I mean, I've got fans, um, three, I think, who will buy any book I write. And, and, and none of them are related to me. So, you know, so there's some something, you know, out of uh, 36,000 followers on LinkedIn, three of them buy my books. So that's you know, just got to get more followers. <laughs> um. All right. Well, let's talk about, you know, so, you, you know, like we said, security your book 2024 will be coming out soon uh, with the help of Wiley. Um, you know, each year you kind of go back and read it and you 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 come up with some new chapters and stuff. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you looked at 2023 and we're putting together 2024, like. You know, I was going to say aside from generative AI, but you can also say generative AI, but like what are the kind of trends you're seeing or, you know, what, what can we look forward to? Yeah, the one thing I was um, expecting was that the downturn would have been bigger, right? Especially in March when of last year when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed overnight. Um, that seemed like a disaster. There, were, uh, Silicon Valley Bank was the bank for about 500 cybersecurity companies, and they had a very trying weekend when they didn't know if they'd be able to make payroll the next week because they couldn't get access to their money. Um, luckily, you know that just blew by and it wasn't you know, long-term didn't seem to have that bad an effect, uh, but it spooked investors. So investors, you know, have never learned the lesson by low sell high, right? They, they just, that pretty much they buy when everybody else is buying is the trend that they follow. And so they're, so, but despite all that, we still saw 10, just over $10 billion in new investments which was the same number of investments is as we had in 2020. So in 2020 was, you know, was a record. $10 billion was the first time we'd ever seen that much invested. And that wasn't too long ago. It was the beginning of COVID. Um, so yeah, we had a blip in there, you know, where in 2022, there was 26, uh, 2021, there was 26 billion in uh, cybersecurity investment. Those days, that was definitely, uh, overheated in retrospect, but um, I, I say we're back on an even keel, steady growth that, uh, and there was, um, I forget the number, maybe um, 320 uh, new investments and 225 or 250 acquisitions last year, which was down 25% from the year before, um, and it's, which is also strange. Hey, if, if the valuations of all these companies are down, how come strategic buyers are being conservative and not buying, right? It's because they're hearing from their stockholders saying, hold back, don't scare us by buying things. Um, I think, you know, in addition to everything else that's going on with the economy, um, I think that there'll be more acquisitions this year because it's once, you know, the strategic investors, strategic buyers start to see that, yeah, it's okay to spend money, they will. And they'll start snapping up some of the companies that ran out of cash so far. And we're going to see more investments uh, this year than last year for sure. Um, I'm predicting 15 billion. Um, let's put that stake in the ground. But it could be a lot more than that because there's a lot of dry powder sitting out there. It's, you know, billions and billions of dollars of money earmarked for cybersecurity investments. And once we get into that frothy fear of missing out, kind of thing that the investors just invariably lead themselves into, um, they'll be upping those valuations again and we'll have crazy times. Well, it is crazy times. And and, and you and I have talked before about, you know, that a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of sky is falling headlines you see are, are you know, not necessarily yeah. borne out with the actual data, you know, that, you know, it, it, you know, it, yeah, it's just you know, the, the, there is money, it is flowing. It's just you know maybe not where you see it, but I also feel like there is, and this is, goes beyond cybersecurity. It goes beyond uh, you know this conversation in general. But there's a dividing, there's a disconnect between what companies and investors look at and say, oh, the economy's good, the economy's bad. I mean, like you know, every single day in the news, you know, it's a headline: the Dow went up, the Dow went down, the S and P went up, the S and P went down. And yes, people have money in 401ks and IRAs, and so they they do have some some 
you know, stake in the game. But for the most part, like that's not an for 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 ninety percent of the population, that is not an accurate measure of is the economy good or not. Like the Dow went up, the Dow went down, doesn't change, you know, my life. <laughs> and and you know, and bringing it back to this context, investing went up, investing went down. Like yes, I think there is a trailing effect on on the job market, but it doesn't seem like companies that had huge investments, you know, still laid people off. Companies that just, I mean, Cisco just bought Splunk and 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 spent a, 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 a ungodly sum of money, and then you know this week let a bunch of people go, uh, you know. So it's like, you know, there there there's a disconnect there, or or at least different priorities, where like it doesn't necessarily. There, there doesn't seem to be a direct direct relation to the actual like people working in the company and the and the jobs available. Yeah, yeah. A lot of public companies wait for um, everybody else to have layoffs, though, so that, especially the ones that are super stressed. So then the Cisco's of the world who aren't super stressed can use that as air cover uh, for making layoffs, and it, you know because. A lot of people follow the old GE methodology of laying off 10% of your people every year, right? Which is really, really cruel. Um, but that's stack ranking, you know, hey, you're on the bottom of performers, you're out, keeps everybody on their toes and, and stressed out, I assume. Um, and that's, you need that air cover, right? If, if, if it's boom times and you're laying people off, investors, you know, the stockholders are going to go, you're an idiot, you know? Figure out a different way because it's expensive to lay people off, right? It's most right. of the companies give them big severance packages. Not ever when I was laid off. I've never <laughs> I was gonna say I feel like the packages have gone down, you know, from my own experience. But but yeah. no, it's a good point. And 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 there's an, then there's investment in, you know, finding new talents and hiring them and onboarding them and like you know all the, the institutional knowledge that you give up when you lay people off. Totally. Um, you know, right. there there are costs involved with all of that. Yep. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Um, I'm not a fan of layoffs, right? Unless you know, when you're in trouble, for sure. But but it should be. Uh, I mean, my opinion is it should be a, 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 a. It is your last resort, not your first move. It's your like yes, this it, you know. To, people always say, well, you know, it's not personal; it's just business. It's like, well, yes, I understand there are business factors and it can be just business you know, it can be a business decision for sure but companies i feel like should also have some level of empathy for people like made life choices to take that job like you know maybe they moved maybe they just maybe they decided not to move maybe their spouse or significant other didn't take a different job so that they could take this job um whatever there's a lot of factors involved and people have lives and families and kids who are doing things that cost money and you know and and there's this like companies expect a level of like uh dedication and loyalty from employees but then are kind of cavalier about okay but we've made a you know a line item decision here that your role is no longer needed goodbye thank you it's been fun right yep yeah and, and you got to wonder about you know, maybe Cyber Reason had to have their huge riff when they did, but Dragos, you know, they're at the top of their game. You now they own the space. They practically have a monopoly on Mindshare, anyways. Um, was that smart to lay people off? Well, and the other thing I was going to say is that you know, and to your point about you, know, you, you wait for there to be cover. You know, it's like the how everyone spent like all of the last year was going on and on and on about well, oh, well, inflation, inflation's horrible. You know, and that's why the economy's bad. We gotta let people go. We we're cutting all these things, and then everyone had like record profit. And and I've made the argument a number of times in various Facebook arguments and LinkedIn arguments. Where I'm like, you can't cry inflation and then have record profit. It doesn't work. Like it, like if there was record inflation, it should have also impacted your bottom line. So like if you're Exxon and Shell, you can't simultaneously say, oh well, the price of oil. What are you gonna do? And then have record profit. Yep. Yeah. And I understand the um, it's PTSD, I think, for economists, because 
in the 80s and 90s, uh, or 70s and 80s, inflation was rampant, right? 25% every year. That was bad. Um, it happens to be really, really good if you're in debt, right? If you've got college debt or real estate debt and fixed uh, terms, then inflation is the best thing that could happen to you. It's like a gift of money every year because you owe less uh, in real terms. So there's ups and downs. And as a matter of fact, inflation is the best thing ever for the government because, boy, do they have debt, right? Trillions of dollars of fixed interest debt. So if they are, if they have to pay 6%, 6 or 7% on treasury bills and inflation is more than that, they're making money. It's just the way it works. So, yeah, inflation isn't the bugaboo, I think, that they make it out to be. And it's it, inflation is a sign of a overheated economy. It means the economy is growing. It means that people are fully employed. It means that prices are going up because of that. There's scarcity. Well, and, uh, those things are good, too. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah right. And there, there definitely are, you know, economic like algorithms that that, that, that I don't understand that, that make that make those things make sense. But bringing it back again to cybersecurity is like, you know, for companies to be like, oh, you know, the, the market's bad. So, you know, we had to lay off a thousand people. We had to lay off 2000 people or whatever. But then they do their, you know, their their quarterly reports and they're like, we made record profit. And it's like, yep. and and, and I, on the one hand, I realized that that's partly because they laid people off. Like that, that's that's why they laid people off. So they could say that. Um, but again, then I come back to the the thing about, okay, but laying people off should be a last resort. You know, you should think about the human beings who are being impacted by that decision. And, you know, if that cuts a little bit into your record profit, then, you know, so be it. Yeah, yeah there should be a measure of uh, um, employee loyalty and like and treat it like a, a bookkeeping thing, right? The more you treat them well, uh, the higher loyalty you have, fewer, less turnover, right? You don't have that attrition going on and and, and you can bank on it. Right. When during really hard times, you can ask them to give things up and they'll stay because they're loyal to you. And that's that's got to be worth something to kind of the play on goodwill. Right. And play. Well, I mean, that's, um, you know, they, they, you, you, you're you're in the Detroit area, so you're very familiar with this. But like the unions went to or, or the automotive uh, you know, manufacturers went to the unions during COVID and said, hey, we need you know, we need some concessions from you. And they gave them. Yeah. And then they and then and then and then Ford and Chrysler and GM were like, we're just gonna let this ride. And the unions mm-hmm. had to go back and be like, oh no, see things have changed now. We we want our concessions back. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um. But yeah, I mean, and and, it, and it's crazy because you know I've seen, you know, it, you know obviously there's thousands and thousands of people who get, are getting laid off. But then I see people who I've known for you know years and 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 respect getting laid off. Where I'm like, well. Sh- shit they're like the best at what they do if they're getting laid off what hope is there for me (laughs) right yeah yeah but yep well we all learn that yeah that that axe can fall at any time well right well so but let's bring this back then you know so so you 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 have this optimistic view um you have an optimistic view of you know the, the tech world in general the investment landscape um yeah so i mean i think that that you know, I, I, I know that you analyze these things for a living. And so I, I, I have a level of respect for your, your, your opinion on the subject. So I'm like, you know, all right, if, 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 if Richard says uh, things are looking up, then I'm going to I'm going I'm to assume things are looking up. Yep. Yep. And I guess with the caveat that I'm forever an optimist and if I was so smart, I'd be rich, um, in stock market calls and obviously I'm not. So there's that too. Yeah. Um, actually, one more one more quick thing on the on the letting people go. I think the the worst of those to me are the ones where they literally just hired them. Oh yeah. Like I know people who the like, onboarding process. Yeah. Yeah, like I know. Yeah, I know people who like were hired and you know like like they left stable employment. Because they were poached and lured over to go, you know, t- take this, you know, higher salary working for like, you know, Facebook, Netflix, Google, whatever. Yep. And like within three months, we're let go. Yeah. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
like the I think the woman at Cloudflare that came internet yeah. for her termination that she was still on probation from being hired. yeah I mean cool. in there in, 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 in to to Tenable and Matt Alderman's credit um, when I joined Tenable I, I started in December like mid almost mid December and so you know how December goes everyone's on vacation there's nobody there so I'm trying to onboard I'm trying to like you know get my bearings and you know, figure out like you know, what, you know who do I talk to and what's my job exactly and didn't make a whole lot of progress the first you know two three weeks because there's nobody around yeah you know? so I was just kind of like hanging out and like the first week of January I get a call from Matt Alderman who I did not know at the time um he's like say hey, this is Matt Alderman you know who I am I'm like no he's like well I'm your boss's boss's boss <laughs> I'm like okay he's like just letting you know your boss is your boss and your boss's boss no longer work here and uh, neither does anyone else on the team that you're you were hired to join and I was like okay <laughs> um but I was not let go he was like but I'm calling like you know that like we're just moving you like you know like we, we we dissolved that team but we're gonna put you over here instead you know so I'm like all right but awesome. I can I can roll with that yeah I like that that's great congratulations so but it was uh it was still a little bit daunting i'm like i've been here three weeks and you dissolved my whole team that i haven't even yeah. met yet what right <laughs> oh my gosh so oh, great. um well, this, this has been great tony yeah i really appreciate your uh having me on we'll have to do yeah it no thank you for, thank you for taking the time and uh i look forward to uh security yearbook 2024. all right i can't wait to see it myself <laughs> all right take care thanks tony bye I appreciate you investing your time to listen to the podcast, but I also invite you to engage on social media. Uh, please go like our Facebook page and follow at Techspective on Twitter and Instagram. You can feel free to let me know what you like, let me know what you don't like, let me know if you love it, let me know if it sucks, and uh, let me know what products you'd like to see reviewed or what uh, questions that you'd like to see answered in future posts.